this is, this is, this is. Hey, what's up, what's up? What do you say, baby? Derek Zanetti, right? That's me. So the Homeless Gospel Choir, is that's a band, but yes. it started out as maybe more of a solo project. What What's the situation with that? Um, and then we can get into, oh, I have so many questions for you. But I have so many um, questions for you, too. Um, right. So, yeah, I just, um, I was at a place in my life where I wanted to express myself in a new way. And I had all my friends played in, like, punk bands and were out there traveling around. And I didn't have very much musical skill or talent. But I could play pretty much every Johnny Cash and Hank Williams song pretty good. If you can get that G, C, and D down, you can, you know, play every single Johnny Cash song there ever has been. So I was like, I like country music, but I don't certainly want to play country music. But I also like the Ramones, too. So I think I can go ahead and play something that's fast and something that has that country type of a vibe to it. And then I just started to go out on my friend. My friend gave me an ovation guitar that sounded like absolute hell. And I went out on tour and just like started to go around and play gigs by myself um, in like 2009 as the Homeless Gospel Choir. Um and, um, yeah, and I've just been doing it full time. Well, I mean, I've had job jobs in between, you know, whenever you're home for quite some time, I would have jobs, but I've been, it's been my full time, um, focus since then. Wow. I love that. Um, as my son would say, like, what's your origin story? He's five, by the way. I'm like, I didn't oh, even man. Know that I didn't know about origin stories until last year, I think. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Netflix taught me about origin stories for sure. Absolutely. Um, uh, I grew up in Pittsburgh. Um, I was born in 1983 on March 28th, whoa. um, to James and Kathy Zanetti. <laughs> and, um, I lived a pretty normal family childhood, I imagine, uh, up until I was about five. And, uh, my parents became members of like this super duper wild, crazy evangelical Christian church. And we started to, we weren't allowed to celebrate Halloween or go to the movie theater. Um, uh, weren't allowed to listen to music, things like that. And um, oh, on the radio, anyhow. And there was like all these other weirdo things that started to 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 happen to me in my life. Very, and very cult sounding. Very much so. Speaking in tongues. They used to take us to the abortion clinic whenever we were kids and would hold signs and like holler at folks and whatnot. So like super wild extremist stuff. Or Catholic. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, just but yes. No, super I, I, like extreme, and and it was it was definitely a big um, a big huge piece of my life, and something that stuck with me until you know well after I graduated high school. Like a thing that you know when you're in that type of feeling and belief, it's not easy. You can't just say, "Well, I'm 18. I don't believe in it anymore. I'll see y'all later." Yeah. You know, when they talk about fear and hell and the devil, it does make you afraid, and those claws dig into you pretty good. And 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 yeah, I guess my origin story from like that era of my life is just like, you know, in, in that, in that, under that Christian umbrella. I yeah. I had more of like a, a I, my, my parents were kind of hippie Christians back in the day. Okay. And, and so I, I grew up going to church, but, but it was more chill than what you're talking about. Like I could listen to music. I could go hang out with friends. I could hang yeah. out with girls. I could, you know, do things I probably shouldn't do because they're not paying attention. Totally. Uh, but I was a pretty good kid. I'm not, I wasn't doing, you know, I, I did get drunk, um, in junior high for the first time. So it was like an early thing, but then I didn't like keep drinking. So sure. I don't know. It was like, Hey, I had that experience. It was cool. You know, uh, later on, of course I found drinking again, but totally, but, <laughs> but uh, everybody kind of in America can relate somehow to, uh, you know, Christianity, the religion, all of that, because it's just so ingrained in, in, half of the country, right? Like maybe sure. more than half the country. Kind of like, you know, if you're in the Middle East, you grow up and you're, you're probably dealing What's with Muslim stuff and not everybody agrees with that either. Even sure. if you grow up doing it, you know? Yeah. Uh, Buddhist, eh, it's pretty chill. <laughs> yeah, they're, pretty, they're, they're not giving anybody any type of grief. We're hey, you know, be nice to your neighbor, you know, don't eat meat, take your time and relax. They're pretty, they're pretty all right. I like, I like the Buddhists all right. Yeah, yeah. And if you don't do what they say, they're not really going to worry about it. Like, they're not going to bomb you. No, they're not going to sweat you at all. They'll still be nice to you, even if you don't agree. Oh, 
oh yeah so dude i was listening to the catalog and it's really fun stuff it reminded me a lot of of um uh, some of my favorite stuff and and i was influenced by country and punk of course and i started writing songs around 90 99 i started writing hank williams-esque country songs and that later became <clears throat> in 2007 i started a band called tumble down mm -hmm. and uh it kind of has a, an Americana folk punk vibe to it. A little more on the countryside than, than you guys. You guys are probably more on the folk punk. But I just love it. Just, it, it you guys would have been great to play with is what I'm saying. We never quite made it to Pittsburgh or, or the East Coast. We were on our way. We were in Chicago. But uh, just bands like that. Like, what are, some, what are some bands that you grew up? Like, what was there anything that influenced besides just straight country and liking sure. punk? Um what are some of the early, early bands that you got into, like specifically? Um, there, when I, I saw a band in 2005 called Endless Mike and the Beagle Club, and uh, I saw them at a fire hall, like a VFW style fire hall in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Um, and it was the most courageous act of punk rock I'd ever seen at the time. It was just like... Nobody was dressed up. It didn't look like you were out looking to look punk. It just looked like average, regular people. And all of a sudden, people started to come out of the crowd with these instruments, and they started to plug them into their amps. And they were just friends of the community, and they just happened to, like, form together like Voltron to make this super huge, epic punk band. And they sang songs for the people and about saying about the human condition and why do I feel lonely and why do I feel afraid and what do I have to do to feel fulfilled in this life and what do I do with bad things and, and po political stuff that obviously is, is is super ugly and bad and what's my role to like wrestle with that and 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 gave a lot of language and gave a lot of um uh, precise articulation to the way that I was feeling inside my heart. And I saw that band play it. And the songs are super basic and easy folk punk songs, songs that you could learn on an acoustic guitar by yourself in your bedroom. And and I saw that and I was like, man, I could I could do something like that. I have feelings too that I'd like to share. And I have, you know, they're doing it in such a way that is, um, uh, is so welcoming and so inviting that, that, that it was totally inspirational to me. Um, but at the same time, there were bands like um, uh, Pat the Bunny and Wingnut Dishwashers Union and Ramshackle Glory, who were also making like very leftist political anarcho type statements with their music and with their art. And I, uh, I found kinship to that as well. Like I, I, I um, a disdain for authority and a disdain for organized religion and uh, for um, uh, political oppression and whatnot. And I was able to see. Uh, give give words to like feelings that I had felt for a long time, and those bands really pushed me in that way to um, pursue even even what I actually believed in. You know, finding for my very own self, like what do you care about, Derek? What do you believe in? How do you feel about this specific issue? And 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 gave me resources to pursue that on my own too. Yeah, that that's great. I, I you know, it hit me when you said you you've always kind of against authority, and I've always felt that that way too. Maybe that's why I gravitated towards punk rock. And mm -hmm. nowadays it's getting very wishy-washy with the being against authority. There's mm -hmm. a lot of bootlickers out there. And I'm not totally. saying you have to go to the right to, to, to question authority. You can be right where you are, wherever you are. Mm -hmm. And I think we're losing some of that in music. A lot. People are scared. Maybe it's the cancel culture. Maybe it's, you know, on all sides, right? Like if you say sure. something too left, then all these other people are going to hate you for it. And if you say something too right, all these people are going to hate you for it. Um, I think it's important to just continue to question authority, question the norms. I mean, nothing ever changes until you question something. Ever. Yeah. And we have, a, we have a duty and a responsibility as people who represent the punk rock community when we see something that's foul to say that it's foul and that it has no place in our world. Mike, we, what, we, what we take care of is very fragile and gentle, and we have to be good stewards of it. And we have to make sure that like, as people involved in like punk rock, that we say no to racism every time. And we say no to sexism and homophobia every time. And like, we don't let it get a foothold in our world. So whenever we see people who we know from our past, like Michael Graves, who goes up and calls himself a proud boy and a white supremacist, we have a duty as the punk rock community to tell them to fuck off that you don't have a place in our world. 
You know, we have to stand up for the, especially as people that have a platform and have privilege to do so. You know, what's crazy is naively, I think I was thinking like 10 years ago, I was thinking, you know, when young people kind of get into power, you know, get into the government uh, as, as we get older, there's going to be a lot less problems. You know, I think, you know, greed is going to be less of an issue. Racism will be less of an issue, like all these things. And it's, it's almost gone the other way, but I mean, things ha I mean, this is just human nature. It's like, uh, we can be manipulated so easily. Mm -hmm. and, and, and for that reason, I think manipulated in a positive way is what we should try to be doing is, is, <laughs> I know it's a yeah. weird way to say that, but totally. I mean, you know, if you're going to say something, be positive. Mm -hmm. Let's go. Let's go. Yeah. Um, yeah. I love how you have like community in your songs. Do you do any protest songs ever or uh, every once in a while we'll sneak a couple of those into the set if we have time. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that's become so crazy. Uh, so what do you do now? Like uh, your new stuff sounds mm -hmm. more, I don't know, more alternative sounding, less folk. Sure. I really dig it. Like it reminded me of uh, almost Seattle style music, like Northwest, cool. uh, uh, maybe not modern Seattle, like uh, like Fastbacks. You ever heard of the Fastbacks? No, I never so, have. Like uh, so good. Just they never really like made it onto Spotify. I don't think you know. They, it's kind of. I'm sure they did. I'm sure. But uh, great band. Just like there's so many bands that like you can draw from or or not ever have heard of. Mm -hmm. But I really dig the new, the brand new stuff that you guys just put out. Is it a split, a split EP? Yeah, we we got um we got a, a, a uh, we did a, two songs and then a band called Teenage Halloween did two songs and it was released on Don Giovanni Records on January first and um the two songs are called Pittsburgh Shoes and Harrisburg Shoes and they were songs that Matt and I uh we we both play in the Homeless Gospel Choir and yeah. write songs together and just wrote like some songs of like care for each other like we've been alone and like kind of in this weird covid world for almost 2 years now and this feels super strange and lonesome that when this is all done there's like this big celebration that I look forward to having and like there is something that's magical about like being in a room together with like-minded people and like you say, spreading positivity and spreading, spreading joy and spreading peace and, and, and being passionate about the art that you make. And, and I've, I've longingly missed it throughout like this time of, of, of COVID-19 and, and, and being able to like be in a room unafraid and being able to see the expression on people's faces whenever you're making music is a big, huge piece of it for me anyway. And like, just writing songs back and forth to each other to encourage each other about uh, the goodness that comes from the uh, the art and the culture that we're a part of. Is that why the sound is different? Because it's it's not it's not like hey, I'm trying to get a message out and I'm gonna be a I'm a folk singer. Now I'm just like writing a song for my dude. <laughs> just writing a song. I mean, is there some part to that? I don't know. Like, it, it, I like both sounds, but they're definitely a little different. So, your last album was 2017, or am I missing anything? Um, there's a there's a record that came out called "This Land Is Your Landfill," and okay. that came out in 2020. And um, your friend Chris Number Two from Anti Flag produced that record, right and on. and we recorded we recorded that in Pittsburgh, and that record was written and 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 sonically sounding different because it was written as to be played as a full band. All the albums that were before that normal and I used to be so young and luxury problems were all just me on an acoustic guitar writing writing these little fragment song ideas, pasting them together and then having them produced in the studio. And Chris number two also did I Used to Be So Young and 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 Normal as well and 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 produced those albums too. Right on. Yeah that, that I think that makes sense. I mean I really like I like the idea that you're just progressing forward. You're changing your sound a little bit. Yeah. I, um, I, there's so much there. You have so many songs, so many albums. I couldn't even like get through it all, you know. But everything I heard, like it was new to me. Uh, I wrote a note here about a song. Let me let me find it. Uh, um, yeah, 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 yeah. I can't find it. But uh, oh, the best things in life. Yeah, um, that was a long time ago for you, probably like 2013 or something like that. Yeah, I don't know when it came out, but uh, for me, it's brand new, and so like it felt really fresh. It felt, it felt like okay, it could have been yesterday that you released that. 
Mm-hmm. So I got I got that feeling throughout, like as I skipped around throughout your your uh, catalog. Sometimes they don't always I don't always take note of the the year it comes out, so I'm not sure when stuff is is released. And th- maybe that's a good thing. And I think that's actually maybe it's on purpose with with mm-hmm. some of these software companies. Like I I use Apple Music, um, although I have Spotify as well, um, and it just seems like they don't necessarily differentiate unless you really try hard to like find an order of albums Mm -hmm. like chronologically Mm -hmm. and then it's starting to differentiate less and less between like a live album and a studio album it's just sure or or a b-sides collection in a studio album it's like as we go forward that's all going to kind of just morph together to people like Mm -hmm. as as i discover your music for the first time i won't know any difference sure you know unless i like really pay attention but I think that's happening across the board. I'm realizing that kind of for the first time in, in checking your stuff out. I uh, just thought I'd like yeah. mention that, but I just think I, I get, I understand that there is, you know, people, I don't know how to say it other than like, when you listen to an ACDC record, you know, you're listening to ACDC period. There's nobody else. You know what you're getting yourself into. They have like a very specific infrastructure in place to to make the songs go a certain way and and it's and it's familiar and the, and the audience is is um looking for that you know if, if acdc put out a weird like avant-garde jazz record nobody would know what to do with it so like it's 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 predictable in in a way that like they're making they're making something for people to to, to consume i've always been more of a fan of, of like I, I I always want to grow it and I don't want to do the same thing twice. And I always want to think of a different way to package this material and these thoughts that are inside my mind in a way that in some ways challenges the listener and some ways challenges myself so that it's still interesting for me to play too. Yeah. Um, and, and hopefully as I continue to grow as somebody who makes art and somebody who makes music that like, I continue to challenge myself and make it interesting, you know, for myself and hopefully it pushes people to to be more brave in the choices of the music that, that they like to listen to as well. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Have you have you heard of Wayne? Wayne? Wayne, Wayne, the band. Oh, the Ween. band Wayne, yeah, that's for like, sure. That's like the t- pinnacle of that. Like They're every, album, <laughs> every album. Sometimes I think they make records to piss their fans off. Like we're just going to put out the weirdest thing yeah. and see if you still ride with us kind of, which I think is kind of funny. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, but that's that's literally their thing. That's literally like I, I love they might be giants for that same reason. Like when you listen to they might be giants, they're all over the place. Sure, they write Looney Tune kids songs, but like they also write like really great rock rock anthems, and they write like yeah. really amazing, intricate you know palindrome songs. A whole song about palindromes and just like super bizarro stuff that I would never think of. But when I listen to They Might Be Giants, I know that it's possible for me too to get on like that, you know, out, outer space vibe and, and create something that's unique, you know? Yeah, yeah. I love They Might Be Giants, by the way. I went through a full phase of listening to them like all the time. Probably yeah. in late junior high. It was around when I was getting into music. But uh, that reminded me though, what do you think about the uh, that Green Day record? Which one? The recent one. The very Jimi Hendrix sounding one. <laughs> I hate it. I don't like it one bit. I don't. I don't like it. Um, I've, I Listen. Agreed. I'm a Green Day Stan all the way. Me too. Dookie changed my life in a radical, transformative way. It let me know that there were other weirdo kids out there that also had weird feelings. And it put, you know, it, it gave me a place to be and like, and then they did it again with American Idiot being the biggest band in the world twice. <sighs> Crazy. But I think for me, I think their newer material, I just, I, I love it the least. Um, uh, and that's the, I think that's the best way I can say it. No, I agree. I, I, it's just funny. It's just like, I was just like, what makes you think that? Okay. I don't know. <laughs> just, but I can't can, hate him for trying something new too. Like no, I got, I, I got to give you a little bit of credit, Billy Joe. You tried something different yeah. and it, you know, you're not making that music for me, but it you're wasn't different for though. yourself. And I, I got to respect that too. It wasn't different though. It was already a song, a couple songs. And that's the thing. It's like, if you're going to do something different, make it original. Like don't rip off somebody that's done it like in the sixties. 
Totally. You know, that's mm. just my critique. I, I am, like I said, I'm with you. I'm a huge fan. I've seen him so many times. I know the guys. Like, but I would say, you know, it was a miss. It was a miss. Yeah. But, but hey, I think you have to they, do that too. Like, I, I don't want to just hit home runs every time. You don't learn anything. When everyone's just kissing your ass and telling you how great you are all the time, you never get to grow. You never get to learn. Making mistakes is your greatest asset and making a misstep or like, I, I wanted to make, I wanted to create this piece of art and I swung for the fences and I struck out. It doesn't mean that that art didn't need to be made, you know? Right, right, of course. With bravery comes stuff like, you know, uh, Meatloaf, Bad Out of Hell and, and Queen, Night at the Opera and these amazing pieces of music that are like way bigger than my mind can ever achieve. But like a number of people chose to be brave and they chose to be risky and they, you know, and if they would have listened to the A and R guy or the record label, they would have never put that out. Nope. Yeah, it would have been completely different and completely boring. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there. I mean, you know, it's funny. You know, the kind of a change of subject, but but the idea that anybody successful that you see when you get into their origin story, they've broken some rules, and totally. I'm sure you've broken some rules, my friend. Um, I have. You know, and and it's hard to tell kids to. Listen to what I do. Listen to what I say. Not, sure. Don't listen to what I do. Listen to what I say. And uh, <laughs> and then also, but if you want to be really successful, like above everybody, you have to break all these rules. Totally. But, but it's like, it's such a, there's no formula to that. Mm -hmm. But is there anything that you can point back to when you started the band or, or even now, you know, where you have to, I mean, don't incriminate yourself, but... But break rules, maybe just going away from the norm, right? Like mm -hmm. going away from the obvious choice of, hey, we want MTV called. They want you to uh, they want you to be on so you can finally talk shit about your sixth grade teacher or whatever. Sure, right? sure. Um, no, I, I think MTV is just a conduit like anything else would be to get your message out there. And if you're creating, you know, if you're if you're if you're making art that you believe in and that you care about and some big, huge, fancy platform like MTV or Fuse or, you know, whatever wants to put out your shit. Um, I, I'm with as long as you're being yourself, I think you could never go wrong. And I'm not saying that to be cliche or be true to your heart and you'll always win type of a thing. But truthfully, I have, and I've always tried to make the thing that I really wanted to make. And like, I've, I, I, I've, I've, um, I've always tried to surround myself, especially now with the band that I have. And, and it, it, in the most recent past working with Chris number two is surrounding myself with like people that I know and that love me and that trust my, uh, trust me and want to make something special. Um, so I don't know. <laughs> If what big rules have I broken? I just try and be nice. I don't know. Maybe that's not the best thing to do. Maybe, maybe that's the I, broken I like, rule. I'll tell you what. I, there's certain nice. things that happen that I'm not afraid to say that I don't like. And I think that is whenever people see, you know, if you're a big famous person and you do this one thing and it's successful for you and someone's like, well, that's not very punk. Um, and not to say that it has to be punk so that it has to be cheap or free or busted. Like DIY shouldn't mean don't improve yourself. It should it should be a special way that we create something that's intimate. But like there are certain bands that do like these $200 meet and greets. And I just think it's like extortion of your fans to do something like that. Like it's not a, it's not a blue collar working class price to go ahead and see some little teeny punk band and then it cost you you know, $400 to sit there and, 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 and sit in a room with them. I just don't particularly want, I don't think that that there's something about just running into Ian McKay on the streets of, of Washington, DC, where he's not charging you a hundred dollars to shake his hand. There's like something human and tangible, tangible about that, that like I find to be very endearing and like human about it. Yes. And like, absolutely. but I just, I wouldn't, I wouldn't shy away from saying, ah, that's not for me. Um, but I don't know. I, I haven't broken that many yeah. rules yet. I do like rules and structure um, because I am in my mind is a feral cat. And if there's no boundaries and no limits at all, I will never get anything done. So I do put like pretty strict um, and for myself. Anyway, I try and make sure that there's like some pretty strict parameters. For what, are, what are your uh, main parameters in life? I got to get up early every day. I got to drink a gallon of water. What's, um, what's early? Um, like seven. Okay. 
That's early for me. I mean, I'm not getting up like, you know, The Rock. Dwayne Johnson's up at four o'clock in the gym every day. I'm not that early. I mean, I am also a, a byproduct of night of like, not, uh, like 90s slacker culture. So like, I do like to like sit in my underwear and smoke weed, you know, in my bedroom. Yeah, so like, of course. there's that too. You love the movie Mallrats. I love it. I love, I love Empire Records. I love that just, I love record store culture. I can remember the day that I bought Slowly Go in the Way of the Buffalo. I can remember it. I can remember listening to it a million times over and I didn't take it out of my CD player for for months. I listened to it on end. And there's a, it's different than it is today, Michael. It's not like just clicking on a button and then you download 10 songs. The leaving of your home, you had to save money and you had to go to a building and you had to look through records and find out the thing that you liked. And there are posters on the wall and a black flag t-shirt. And 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 there was all this sensory, there, there was incense burning inside of the record shop. And there's, you know, Motorhead is playing over the loudspeaker and like you're, you're flipping through all the records or CDs or tapes or whatever. And I can remember finding the thing that I was looking for and the MXPX had a little, there was a little label on the CDs when you flipped the room that had your band name on it. So I went right to it and I picked it up and I listened to it. And it was like a romantic experience. It wasn't like, it, it, I'm, I'm not trying to say, well, kids just click on a button and I got their albums. But there is like, there was a, there was a process of doing it. Mm -hmm. And like even before my, our parents had a CD player in the car, which was a big, huge luxury item at, at that particular moment, like we went home and I listened to it in my Discman with my really crappy Casio headset. And I would just sit there and I would just listen to it a whole bunch over and over again. I wonder how that sounds on those headphones. Were they the kind that have like foam, but they kind of still, the plastic still hurts? Terrible. You can't they lay sound, on a I mean, terrible. The sound quality was shit. Um, but it's all you have, so you have to do it. I wonder if it was mastered for that. Like, what? <laughs> I don't know. Back in those days. Uh, that's funny. Things do sound different. They're mastered differently these days than they were in the 90s. And that album came out 97, 8? 1998, 90, yeah. Yeah, 98, yeah. Wow. Hmm. But there's a bunch of those bands of that era that I remember, like, going to pursue. Um, for the, like of that, like tooth and nail era of, of your life, um, the Danielson family are a band that I still listen to, to this very day that blow my mind. Do they still put make... out music? Oh yeah. I oh, played wow. with them at a bar not too long ago and they're still like super duper Christian-y singing about Jesus and the whole bit. But I just think that it's so cool that he just chose to be a weirdo yeah. and like, I love it's super culty feeling yeah. like to watch them like in their in their, you know, other outfits and singing about Jesus. Like, I feel like I'm going to, you know, have to drink a drink and they're going to you know suck my brains out or whatever. But I like it. It's almost like you get it's privileged to get to see this in the flesh. Like this is like a little slice of Americana weird history mm -hmm. while it's happening now still. But for me, it's like I'm just thinking of it in the past. But. It is culty, and I'm. I wonder, I wonder what what goes on, be, you know, in the dressing room back there. Like, what do they do? I'm sure it's teacups and pussy sure. cats, but uh, diet sprite and flavorless crackers. I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. What's your dressing your your backstage like? Do you guys party? Do you drink beer? Do you? Um, some people in the band do. I'm the only one in the band who doesn't drink beer. I've been I've been off the sauce for uh, about almost seven years now, so I, um, I'm super stoked to not drink anymore. I wasn't the best. I had bad habits. I had I have a mountain of bad habits, and I'm slowly slicing them out. I smoke weed. I drink diet coke, and I swear around children. So those are the things that I do that are bad. Um, but the rest of me, I'm pretty, I'm pretty perfect on, I think. I think I'm getting to be pretty perfect. I, I, uh, wouldn't, I wouldn't say any of those things are bad necessarily, by the way. So uh, <laughs> take it easy. I, you just named half the country. <laughs> Diet Coke, smoking weed, and I love to cuss in front of little kids. I know that it's bad, but I love to do it. <laughs> um, my, my daughter, she's nine, and she's so proper. She follows all – she's a rule follower totally. to the T. And she knows all the swear words, and she will not say them. And, I, and I'm just wondering, I'm like, is there, like, am I, we're going to find out that she's been totally, like, different behind closed doors. Because that does happen. Like, sure. you can act totally perfect in front of your parents and fool them. But I the, did, the for other sure. day, she's like, the F word. And I'm like, what? She's like, yeah. 
F U C K. I'm like, whoa, she knows it. Like she, <laughs> I'm like, okay. Uh, is there any, she's on the beat. She's a P she's, she's making sure no one's stepping out of line. I like it. Yeah. I is, like a little accountability. Is there any need for me to, to hold my tongue now? That's my question. I'm sure my wife would, would definitely say, yes, there is. Mm -hmm. We still have a five-year-old, but, um, I've had friends who had like super cool liberal parents who were like hippy dippy ish and they turned out to be like absolute shitheads. And then I've had friends who had like completely absentee parents who, didn't do a good job of parenting and they like kind of raised themselves and they turned out to be like super self-sufficient, kind, caring, uh, egalitarian people. So like, I don't know if it matters. I don't know if, I don't mean to sound, I don't mean to sound nihilistic on your podcast or <laughs> my career, but I don't know if it fucking matters what you do to your kids. I think they'll figure it out. Let's burn it down. <laughs> um, but we do, our, we backstage, we do have a rider and we get, um, we get a couple cases of soda water, Topo Chico, preferably. Um, and we get fresh berries, strawberries, raspberries, blueberries, hummus, sliced vegetables, um, you know, just little snack type things, peanut butter and jelly. I like to keep it super duper modest on a rider because if you're just like really cool about it, you'll get it almost every time. Mm -hmm. When you start saying, you know, I want a case of Monster Energy drink and a thousand packets of Oreos, then they're like, okay, buddy, you're being a little greedy. But if you can keep that, if you can keep that rider budget like under a hundred bucks, you're like, you'll usually get it. What's the craziest thing you've asked for on a rider? Well, my friends in the chariot told me that if you ask for new socks, that they'll give them to you. So that's when yeah. I started to ask for new socks every day. This was like in 2011 and 12, whenever I first started to, they, people started to want me to have nice things. And, um, I would go ahead and I would say, yeah, I mean, can I get a pack of Hanes Black Socks Crew Socks? And I would get them. I would get them just like a regular large size sock. So um, yeah. I've, asked for, I've asked for weed before in, in the UK and in Europe. And I think, I, I, I mean, I got it in Amsterdam for sure, but I got it in Germany too. And I think I've got it and I got it in Linz, Austria, whenever I was, um, when I was on tour with Anti-Flag over there. Um, uh, but yeah. It's not that I, great, I but it works. Some, I keep know. it. Yeah, it works. We actually got burned. Chris, not Chris number two, but the other guitar player from Anti-Flag, Chris Head and I went to, he was like, give me 20 bucks. I know that we're going to go. I saw the sign, the green sign. You can go ahead and buy some weed. So I went over to go buy it and it was just like CBD weed. I was so bummed out. Like I was so bummed out because it was it was about a week and a half and I'm over there and I'm just having like this vape pen and it's making my voice sound like shit and I hated it. And then I was like, I'm going to actually smoke real weed and get stoned and it's going to be awesome. And then I just bought some just gross like shake and it was all just weed that didn't get you stoned and it was expensive. And then I obviously I spent everybody's money. I went and collected everyone's money to go to the weed store and I came back with just like busted joints. It was kind of heartbreaking. I won't go into the details, but that's happened to us with, with uh, the Ataris. But we got ripped off, like oregano, some weird thing. Or... <laughs> that's great. Yeah. You know that there's some kid that has his own podcast, and he said, you know, those assholes in the Ataris and MXPX, they thought they were going to be slick and try and get a cheap <laughs> bag of weed for me. But I just poured my mom's oregano in it, and there they go. Yeah, right. These guys were professionals for sure. For I sure. love it. You got, you got hosed. London, what are you going to do, man? But I learned my lesson. That was a long time ago. Long time ago, folks. Uh, but <laughs> if there's anybody from immigration listening, um, yeah. But You'll that's, be right. that's why you don't you don't care you don't you know you don't fly with it or anything. But some bands do. Some yeah, bands I do. did. I had the pens. I had the I had the little oil pens, and I just had it in like a little bag with my sharpie markers that I kept, and nobody gave me any type of guff. I do that, but yeah, I don't really consider that the same thing because it's now like, that's. Yeah, it's a, what? What are you talking about? Yeah, really? it looks like lip balm. I had these little things that just look like little lip glosses, so nobody would have get nobody would have said anything to yeah, me. Yeah, exactly. I have a question for you, Mike Carrera. Let's go. Tell me about your friendship and your relationship with Louis D. Fabrizio. Are you friends with him? Very much so. Uh, I met Louis a long time ago, although I don't remember it. And then, <laughs> but over the years, uh, we've just become really good friends. Uh, he's the best. He he would come out and hang out with MXPX. So he sang on a couple of our songs, uh, on records and stuff like that, like harmonies. And um, we toured together back in it was when MXPX was kind of 
maybe doing one or two shows a year oh, boy. Um, for a couple of years. I did a solo tour with him, you know, and we just toured Florida and Alabama and like all the most terrible, worst places <laughs> I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. And it was so much fun. We had a great time. Um, yeah, Lewis Gasoline Heart, you know, he's he's uh, he's a crazy motherfucker. He, he he's is. got his own moving company. And Lou moves you, Lou moves which you. is so funny. It's so it, punk rock. He does because he does know. move you. Those gas, yeah. those those gasoline heart records are not not slouch albums. They're so good. And like I always thought that the biggest crime against humanity in regards to rock and roll goes is the gasoline heart wasn't the biggest band ever. Like they should have been. Um, yeah, we put them on the bill every now and again, and it's always like people just staring. But you know what? A bunch of those people are going to check out Gasoline Heart because they're going to think that's a pretty good song. song. That's, yeah. you know, people aren't prepared for – have you heard about Huey Lewis and Stevie Ray Vaughan? No. So Huey Lewis in the news, you know, they were in their heyday and they, uh, they're like, we want, we want Stevie Ray Vaughan to, to come play. And everybody's like, well, they should be paying us because you know, they were asking for too much money. And he was like, just pay him, just pay him, you know, it, they're worth it. You'll see. And first show, they get up there and just rip, rip up the place. But the crowd's just like, Huey, Huey. And they were pissed and they go off stage and, and Huey's like, look, these people come, they listen to the records on the way to the show, just like they all do to the, all the punk shows and stuff, you know, and, and they're hyped. They're hyped to see us. There's no way people are going to be ready to see you play, but it's going to hit them later. It's going to mm-hmm. hit them you know, the next day that that band was badass and totally. I'm going to check them out. And and yeah. that's exactly what happened. Like it blew up Stevie Ray Vaughan from doing that tour. Mm-hmm. And, you know. There are certain shows that you play first. Some, you know, you have, you're, when you're a support band and the, the crowd is only there, like you're only in the way of the crowd seeing the headlining band. And, um, one time I was doing, I was playing with less than Jake and it was on their Hello Rock View uh, 20 year anniversary tour. And nobody wanted to hear me with my acoustic guitar singing about my feelings. Nobody yeah. gave a shit. They were just like, are you serious? Can't less than Jake just play for an extra half an hour? What are you doing here? Um, <laughs> and it was fine. Like there's people like, you know what you really did? You got booed and you stuck in there. So that's super sick. Um, but yeah, I, 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 t- I totally know that. Oh man. I mean, I don't mean to f- feel bad about it, but like we've, we've gotten booed, booed, not off the stage, but booed and had things thrown at us so many times back yeah. in the day. And it's been a while since that ha- that's happened. But I mean, I feel like if you don't have that, it's kind of like a, a comedian the mm-hmm. first time they bomb and they realize, Oh, this is real. This is mm-hmm. insane. You know? And, and it just kind of like changes you a little bit. And I think dealing with, some of the things that we've dealt with over the years, it, it's, it's made me like, people can call me a shithead. They can call me anything, you know, mm-hmm. and I almost won't, I won't react to it. You know, <laughs> I was playing, I was playing in, um, I was in playing a show in San Diego. I was on tour with leftover crack and I made a joke about how I don't like the band sublime. And I was in San Diego and I was talking shit on Sublime and a kid threw a full beer can like a quarterback from halfway across the the room and hit me right in the face. And I had this big, huge bump on my eye. And I mean, I laughed it off like I just like, ah, I hope we have another beer. They're eight bucks. You know, I just said something funny about it. But um, Chris Rock, don't don't say anything bad about Sublime in Southern California. They'll get you. Oh, yeah, I bet. Even if you don't like them, just keep it zipped. Because they'll come for you big that's, time. That's like you got Dixie chicked. Totally. <laughs> By that one <laughs> dude. <laughs> Don't do it. How insane is that? That they said something in London, but in the day of the internet, you know, you say something, it could be on video. So if you're a famous country, you know, group or whatever, mm-hmm. they got canceled like by all the country stations, all big the time. country TV, whatever. Mm-hmm. And it turns out they were right. You know, it was, and it wasn't that bad crazy of a thing to say you know it was just like but back then you know it was before trump it was before like the the age of shock maybe Mm -hmm. i don't know i think it was a great when you watch that old video of sinead o'connor ripping up a picture of the priest on saturday night live i'm like that's the most punk shit period like you actually address power in front of a world stage where you're have you're speaking on behalf of women and women's rights you're like nope 
Not interested, buddy. I think it was sick. Yeah, absolutely. So powerful. And and I, I there wasn't a lot of context there for people. And I think that's that's exactly why it got fucked up is because because that's all it was. So hey, we can just yeah. write our own story. And they sure. do you know, the media always does. You know, they mm-hmm. always write their own story. That's mm-hmm. something I learned early on too. Not early on enough, but but just, you know, once we were signed to a major doing, you know, Spin Magazine, Rolling Stone, you know, these journalists come and talk to you and everything's on record. Everything. Yeah. Unless you specifically say, you know, and I didn't know that. Like, and so, mm-hmm. and Yuri didn't know that, our drummer. So, like, there was things that we would say that we felt, oh, crap, that's mm-hmm. in the article. So, and then I'll they also- create a whole story out of context based on that. That's nothing, has nothing to do with what you said. Totally. And I mean, that's, they want something that's sensational. So they'll say something that's sensational and helps to get you swept up into it so that they get you to slip up to say something that they can put on some sort of a headline, which is super manipulative and isn't journalism after all. It's just whatever we can go ahead and get for clickbait, especially now. But um, I want to say something about Yuri. Um, Yuri was the hope that I needed to know that I too could be a square and be in a punk rock band. Because my Carrera has tattoos and had like a cool haircut and you were really like a cool looking punk rock guy. No doubt about it. But Yuri looked like me. I was like, wait a second. No one's going to let me be in a punk rock band. And Yuri just looked like a regular old guy. And I was like, this is great. Um, This is super important. Looking back, you know, hindsight 2020. Well, maybe not for you and Yuri, but without your glasses. Uh (laughs) Sorry, bad joke. Uh, <laughs> but looking back on Yuri, like maybe that was part of why we were so popular. Like a little, like it takes more than one thing, you know. Like, you know, sure, I was writing the songs and singing, but I wasn't that great of a singer, you know. Maybe not then, maybe not even now, to be honest. Uh, but Yuri, bringing that everyman vibe and kicking ass at the drums. Very good drummer. I mean, he he got better and better as we went, and. Um, once we hit life in general, that's that's when it took off, of course. But I'll, I'll let him know. I'll let him know. Yeah, tell your I said what's up. Tom and I are friends on the internet too. Every once in a while, we'll send pleasantries back and forth to each other. Tom, um, no Tom, big deal. Thomas Nesky is the most social of butterflies. Oh of, yeah, uh, of anybody I know. He he gets around. Uh, he knows everyone. He keeps in touch with everyone. Mm-hmm. I don't know how he does it. He's very encouraging. He always has a nice like wink and a nod and is like, oh, I remember that type of a deal. He's very, he's a good buddy. He's a good buddy to have in your corner for sure. He is. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I feel that. I feel that. Right on. So uh, we could go anywhere. You know, uh, we could go, (laughs) we could go to, uh, you know, Woody Guthrie. Did you ever get into him? I'm a big Woody Guthrie fan. Um, Me as I, well. I, I'm, I'm a huge. I, I think it's. He might be my favorite American songwriter. Okay, I could I could hear that. I could hear that. I I, I love Woody Guthrie. Um, I like when I was getting into like Hank Williams and, and stuff like that. That I also got into Woody Guthrie and, um, of course, uh, Bob Dylan. I mean, that's sure, a, a of course, given, a given, but um. And it's funny. It's like, you know, I'm sure there's people that don't like Bob Dylan because he's too big or he's too famous or something like that. But it's like he truly was a one of a kind person. And back in those days, they didn't even write all their own music. You know, mm-hmm. they write their own words or change the words up or whatever, but like take the melodies. And and I kind of dug that. And that, that's that's a lot of what the blues is. It's a lot of what country music is and, and punk rock nowadays, you know, like it's it's the totally. and hip hop. And the, the lines are just starting to blur back into that i'm seeing parallels more and more between those early days of like i would say 1940s uh music and on but blending with what we do now which is we're back to singles we're back to people doing one or two songs live and then and then the next group comes up you mm-hmm. know because maybe it's like a dj or it's a sure you know they have everything on tape or something like that you know like that's coming back or not coming back but that was a thing back in the day, and now it's coming back in a different, yeah. more modern form. But- a lot of people would argue that Bob Dylan's a lousy singer, and I think I would agree in many ways. And I think that's why I like him so I, much. I agree, but I also love his voice. I love totally. what he does. Yeah, yeah, it I, works I, for that. 
Totally, with Woody Guthrie, too. Like, there's so many Woody Guthrie songs that are flat, absolutely all the way flat. Or if you listen to Daniel Johnston and you hear, like, a human being expressing themselves with passion and care, like, it it, it doesn't always sound pretty. It doesn't always sound in perfect pitch. Um, but it does sound honest. And I think those are the songwriters that I think that I lean towards the most. Like, who's going to tell me something that's capital T true and, like, really going to blow my mind with how they thought about something that is so common that we've all thought about a million times? But when Connor Oberst from Bright, Bright Eyes says it, it really makes me think something special. It really takes me to a certain place. When Bob Dylan says it, it's like, oh, my goodness, you are on to something. I feel the same way about um, Aaron Weiss from Me Without You. When I listen to Me Without You, when I listen to that band, like I feel like a spe- his voice isn't always what I think it should be, but it's definitely exactly what it needs to be in order to make the song work good. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Uh, you're right. I mean, there, there's just honesty transcends. Yeah, and performance transcends accuracy totally. or you know whatever it is that we you know nowadays maybe it's just like that. If you take that and auto tune it, it's gonna sound like a completely different thing, you know. But like Bob Dylan or Connor Oberst singing Britney Spears would be weird, right? It totally. wouldn't quite fit, or maybe it would be an epic. I don't know. Somebody, somebody, people love that shit. Yeah, I, I mean, whatever. you're giving Spurs. real human feeling and real human emotion to something that is so like vanilla and like palatable for everybody. Mm-hmm. And maybe it would be sick. Maybe the uh, right song. Maybe some. I mean, Taylor Swift sort of goes back and forth between some like super sugary pop productions mm-hmm. and then like acoustic folk, you know, heartfelt memories of, from her childhood. Like, I mean, it, she's an anomaly, but, but it, it just shows you what's possible and it shows totally. you what's always been possible. Really. My wife is a Swifty. Lindsay, Lindsay is a, uh, is an absolute Stan all the way. Every new record, every new variant we're going to get, we get stuff in the mail all the time. What's this? The new Taylor Swift refrigerator magnet. She's on it. She's get the cup. She got the sweater, the cardigan sweater. Um, we're Taylor Swift. We have Taylor Swift coming out of our ears. I would, I would get, um, cause sometimes whenever you buy stuff from like a big box store, they get returned like if the corner's bent and they would just go on eBay. So I wait for like two or three weeks after a record comes out and you can get a Taylor Swift record for 12 bucks. It's the best. And then Lindsay's happy, and I'm happy, and she gets a Taylor Swift record, and I don't have to, you know, spend forty dollars on it. Wow, yeah, that that yeah. makes sense. That's good. yeah. But I love. I we listen to a ton of Taylor Swift, and those songs do get into my mind. They do. They do creep in there and like stay. Like she's a great song crafter. Um, I have a question for you, Mike Carrera. How much when you go to write a song? How much of it do you think about business? And how much of it do you think about art? Um, Percentage-wise or uh, how to best describe? Um, Because you write songs that are poppy and you write songs that have an appeal to them that aren't just like weirdo avant-garde things like somebody puking on a microphone. So like you're making something that is – um, that is is palatable and digestible by a mass market of people. How do you determine I'm going to be true to myself and I'm going to say something that is authentic to me and balance? I want people to like it and want it and buy it. Um, it's mostly all art because I tend to like what we put out. I feel like if I was going to write for the audience, it would be different than what it is. Cool. Because I feel like I do write Sometimes simple, but quirky, quirky songs, you know, and then it's interlaced with some, you know, more straightforward punk songs and pop punk, skate punk songs. But like, um, I would, I'm just was writing a, I'm working on a song right now. Um, so I'll think about that. Um, I've got like a chorus, but it might be a verse that's super, super catchy, like a chorus, you know, like something like that. And, and I'm not sure what. I could just cop out and just write the verse that I have and just finish it. Or in my mind, I feel like, no, it needs to be better. Now, is that because of business or, you know, or, or the audience? I don't think so. I think it's because I know that I, one, I'm not under a deadline. Um, mm-hmm. I don't need to finish the song right now. And mm-hmm. if I did need to finish the song, I probably would just 
it would be what it was. But mm. um, I'm just thinking about what flows and what I want to sing back to. And so I'll just do like the same part over and over and over and kind of see where it, where it goes to. So mm. I've got... I've got like five parts to the song and that's too many. It's like too long. So sure. now I need to like, I think there's one part that's going to become a whole new song and totally different, like in, in sound or whatever. But mm. things like that happen to me all the time where I'll, I'll come up with a song, I'll be writing it. I'll come up with what I think is the bridge and that becomes a whole new song. Mm -hmm. And then I'll rewrite the bridge a different way. And I just finally get there and I, and I feel like, Hey, as long as the process works and I'm not under any duress, mm -mm. I'm not worried about it. I'm in. I was, I was, I, I always think about that because everybody writes songs differently and for different reasons. Mm -hmm. And there are, there, um, um, you have to play a lot of old songs that you wrote when you were a child. Yes, that's true. You do. Yeah. yeah. And like, I think that, like, I think about, do I feel the same way? I think I have a lot of tattoos. I don't have as many as you do, but I'm, I'm, I have it pretty much covered everywhere you can't see. And I think about like, if I got all the tattoos that I wanted whenever I was 16 years old, I would just have MXPX tattoos. Um, <laughs> and I think about like, do I feel the same way that I feel, that I felt when I was 16, 17, 18, 22, 25 years old? I feel very, very different. Right. How do you, how do you differentiate that? How do you, how do you sing about something from your past that you cared about so deeply that you wrote a song about it whenever you were younger and then still have the same, um, have the same vigor about it now that you are not a teenager. Well, um, I pick and choose the songs. Sometimes I change lyrics and sometimes we just don't do songs. If it's something that I just completely don't really feel, then I, mm -hmm. we just won't do it. There's a couple, but, but, um, for the most part, um, songs like falling down, we just did at our last couple shows and, most of the people didn't really know that those songs. There's from our second album. Mm -hmm. Not it's not punk rock show. It's not you know the first song on the record, which is Sugar Coated Point is an apple. Um, Falling down is like way back, I think. And but the lyrics still ring true today. I mean, mm -hmm. it's we're still dealing, struggling with inequality. We're struggling with uh, the powers that be, whether it's governments or corporations in charge of things, unelected officials making decisions for us. We're constantly dealing with the clash of that. Now, I wasn't thinking that exact thing probably when I wrote the song, but it, but if you listen to the lyrics, it fits perfectly. And, totally. and it still pisses me off to sing that and think about what I'm singing, and it makes me mad about why is this so hard for everyone? You know, so, sure. Things like that. You know, like I, 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 I tap into the tr the true, the the things that are still true. I think. Yeah. Um, for always is another song off slowly going the way of the buffalo. I do that acoustically. We do that with the band still now and again. We'll throw. We just have you know, like you, you have a ton of songs. You know, you can't play them all. No. Um, but you know, we'll throw those in now and again and. And I like to throw in ones that still that I still believe in, you know, like a for always. And and no matter what you do believe, you know, what your worldview is, the mm -hmm. lyrics for for always can can be uplifting. And and I don't feel like they're like middle of the road. They're they're just literally saying, like, let's help each other out because, mm -hmm. you know, maybe things weren't going to be the best, but things are going to at least not be as shitty as they are now. Totally. That, that's all I'm trying to say with for always. Right. And and, and to look back and think good thoughts about the, the good memories you have. Why not? Right. Yeah. Cause that's, that was my perspective then. And, and I guess it probably still is. <laughs> yeah. I mean, getting, getting people to smile and feel good in an age where everybody's paranoid and scared is an act of revolution. It really is to, to, to bring, to bring kindness and peace and even nostalgia to be like, this song was super important to me when I was in high school. And now I get to listen to it as a grown up with my kids. I'm sure that there's like a big, um, a big feeling about that too. Yeah. And the best part is, is we don't just have the nostalgia. We have the new albums and the new songs that we've released yeah. and, and we're still writing, you know, so it's, it's like, wow, we get, we get to have this catalog and continue to, to make, in my opinion, as good, if not better music than we ever have. Um, yeah. Just, just because we've done all the mistakes and, and it's funny, like 
it's still not easy to make a record as, as many times as you've done it. It's like, it almost gets harder. Right. You know, sometimes I think I'll never be able to write a good song ever again. Yeah. Like sometimes I'm sitting there with my guitar. I'm like, I'm fucking absolutely terrible at this. And it's a miracle that anybody claps for me ever. Um, but then, you know, you get through the weeds and then you figure out how to write a good song again. But there are moments where I pick up my guitar and I'm like, I don't even know what to do with this thing. I feel like an absolute fool. I, I, I know exactly how you feel like, and that's, I mean, how do you how do you deal with that? I know how I would deal with that, and I've talked about it plenty, and I'm happy to talk about it. But how do you deal with that? Is there a way that you've gotten through that over the years where you don't worry about it? Because the thoughts do come, like, I'm probably not going to write a good song again. But then do you realize that's dumb? I do realize that that <laughs> is um, – that you can, the potential to make anything is inside of you. And that if you have a, enough imagination and you have enough fearlessness inside your heart, you can create anything. That like, when I go to write a new song and I, and I have a new idea of, of what I'm working or, or uh, something I'm working on, I think about like, if I turned on the radio right now, what would I want to hear? What's the sound that I would want to hear that would blow my mind? You know, like whenever... I'm sure it's happened to you many times, but you know, like when you listen to a record for the first time and it's something that's new and it blows your mind. Like the first time I listened to the shape of punk to come by refused. And I never heard anything else like that in my whole life. Yeah. And it fucking blew my mind that like human beings made this music or like, the first time you listen to at the drive-in and it's just like this whole new weirdo thing that like is possible for you to like, participate in and enjoy and like and like I just try and do that like how can I I've already written the song normal so I don't think I'd want to ever write that song again because I think I you know I got that out of me but like what new songs do I want to write and what new things do I want to say and if I only have three minutes uh, like on that movie that Joaquin Phoenix movie about Johnny Cash walk the line yeah. and whenever the the record guy comes up to him and says if you were dying in a ditch and you could only sing one song one song ever would it be all that real boring glory hallelujah stuff or would you say something that was real and Johnny Cash was like do you have any problems with the US military well I do and he went ahead and he wrote a song about it and I was like that feeling I try and get to that feeling I try and get to the arc of the story and feel like what can I, I got one song left, I'm dead in a ditch, and they're going to forget who Derek Zanetti is and, and never think about him ever again. I get one last chance to go ahead and say my piece. What do I want to go ahead and say? And like, I try and take myself to that place whenever I feel like I'm stuck in the mud. And then I'll also listen to familiar standards that are easy to play, like Johnny Cash, like Woody Guthrie, like Bob Dylan, you know, like Connor Oberst even, to play like things that are structurally pretty square so that I can go ahead and get in, get into the vibe of like finding a new chord or finding a melody that I didn't know I, that, you know, re reverse engineering a, the bridge to a Bob Dylan song and then figuring out the reverse melody. I'm like, oh, this sounds cool. How can I, how can I work with this sonic that already kind of exists? That's interesting. Yeah. Reverse engineering a song. I mean, why not? I, I, I can't believe I re haven't really thought of that. Wow. Yeah. My just like there's this right now. There's this part of like, you know, when, when obviously if you go ahead and you play long view by green day, everybody knows what that song happens to be, but there's little parts and little notes of it that you can just play that bridge backwards. And it sounds completely different. And you play it and you're not playing it as a halftime. You're playing it as, you know, four, four straight up. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And like, how does that make you feel different? And they're chords that you're already familiar with. And it's not like I'm going to take that part and just completely snag it and rip it off. But it does birth like all this other type of imagination and creativity to just tell yourself, what if, you know? Yeah. Yeah. When I was when I was just just before I even started playing an instrument, I was I was hanging out um, watching this band Bad Juju. And I told this on our, our Kids at Punk Scene podcast a couple episodes ago. But Basically, long story short, Lumpy was playing bass, and he's like, here, check this out. Do, 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 do. And then, like, for the next part, you just do it in reverse. Do, 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 do. Well, I don't know how to do it, but you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. he play that backwards, and he's like, there, we have a song. I was like, oh, weird. Like, okay. But that was before I even played anything, but I never, I never took that to, like, melodies and... and mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess just that that's just I'm just thinking about it. That's really And just like loop it, just like you would have a loop like a sample on a loop yeah. pedal. Just have it and click it and I'm, I, just like you said playing the same part 
over and over and over and over again till it just is in your mind and then it's it's a standard and then you could take that melody anywhere that you want to take it into the stratosphere figure out instead of bringing it back to C put it in an F sharp and the song is completely different absolutely yeah that's that's one thing I've learned over the years is like singing something that you you're going to be able to sing live like I mean I guess it depends you know on what type of act you are but we're a, we're an act that likes to be able to represent what we do on records live totally and so not going too crazy it's like okay let's push ourselves i want to push myself but i also want to remember oh we're gonna be like we're gonna be like uh you know 45 minutes in yeah okay <laughs> let me make totally. sure i can sing this later mm -hmm. and so in some ways you would think okay so i got more conservative but i just no i'm just writing things that i feel good about singing mm -hmm. and in the long run, it's going to be that much better because I'm going to kill it live. I'm going to just be nailing these parts. Do you ever feel like you, you ever do stuff like that in the studio where you have to change your keys to like hit different notes? I used to. I used to just I would just capo my guitar because I was also a smoker for a long time, and I was I was I I used to drink a, a bunch that would, my voice would go bad too. So like. I would just, if I couldn't sing in the key, I would just take the capo and I would just put it there because I'm just playing by myself and I would just figure out a new melody for it and just like play it live there. Um, but one thing that's great about the band that I have now is that everybody is an absolute surgeon with their instruments and I'm allowed to just be the bubbling, the bubbling idiot that just lets my guitar feed back and like make it sound like a pixie song. You know what I mean? Like they're... <laughs> They're so in the box and so good. Craig, our drummer, is the best drummer. Matt's the best guitar player. Moore and Megan are the best bass player and guitar player I know. And, like, I get to just be the singer and have fun and dance around and, you know, uh, have, a, have a blast. And I can I have trust and faith to know that they're going to hold it all together for me, which is sick. That's awesome. So how long have you been doing the full band uh, tours? Um, well, right before we, we did two tours right before, uh, quarantine mm. and we were, we were building up to release this record and we had a bunch of shows planned for it too. Um, we actually, do you know the band Harley Poe? Uh, no. Calibretto 13, Joe from Calibretto 13 is in like this really amazing horror punk band. Okay. Not Christian at all. They sing about having sex with your, with your digging up your neighbor's dead body and having sex with it. Like super weirdo, bizarro horror, gross murder, death type stuff. And it's like for kids, it's like childish in its approach, but like super gory and gross. Anyhow, it's called Harley Poe. And it's, he just writes like these songs about super gross shit. Mm -hmm. And then goes out on tour and tours with them. And we were on tour with Harley Poe, right? That was the last thing we did. Actually, the last thing we did is we played a show in Detroit with the Suicide Machines for their Black Christmas um, event that they do. And I was, I, if I knew that that was the last time I was going to play live music, I would have, I didn't think it was. I, I, I might have done something differently. Um, but yeah, we did, we did, we did two, we did two, we did two uh, tours right before. Um, and then the album came out in April, which was like a month after. Um, the world shut down. It's kind of crazy, but I always think now, no matter where I go, even if it's like Pittsburgh, I always feel like it could be my last time in Pittsburgh. So I always, that's my mindset. But uh, I want to hear about your, so you have some tours coming up, right? Like May? We do. I'm, we're going out with your friends in Bad Cop, Bad Cop. Awesome. Yeah, that'll be great. Yeah, we, um, we've we been pals for a bit. We played we played Punk and Drublick Festival um, a, a few years back and just became great pals. And uh, Jenny and my wife actually work together um, on the internet. My wife has a publishing company and, and, and has been working with Jenny about putting some putting a book together. And yeah, I've, I've, known, I've known them for quite some, you know, for a bit. And I'm excited to do this, this tour with them. We're going to go up to Canada. We're playing Montreal and, and Toronto. Be fun. Right on. Yeah. I mean, Bad Cop, Bad Cop put on a great show. They're so great as people. Yeah. I mean, nothing but the best. For yeah, sure. they're super cool. Awesome, awesome. So that's in May. Everybody can uh -huh. check out. Where's your website, you think? What's the you can go to www.thehomelessgospelchoir.com, and all the dates are up there. Um, and then in June, I'm announcing some solo acoustic shows of, like, the East Coast, mostly. We're going to go to um, – it's not up yet, but by the time this podcast comes up, it'll be up. Cool. So, um, like um, – 
Columbus, Ohio, Cincinnati, Nashville. We're playing some shows in South Carolina, which I never go down south. And we're playing some North Carolina shows up into Virginia and then ending in Pittsburgh. And that's just me, solo acoustic. And then um, playing a big festival. We're playing like this this, uh, vintage fair in Chicago um, with, you know, the band The Tossers from from Chicago, the Celtic punk band. Um, I don't know them personally, but I've heard of them. Yeah. yeah. um, We're playing a gig with them. We don't know them either. So we're going to meet them for the first time. Right on. And then we're going to go out on tour with My Chemical Romance um, uh, later on this year in September and October with the band, with Thursday and the band Midtown. I've never met Midtown, and I don't know if I've ever heard any of their songs, but I heard that they're nice people, so I'm excited to meet them too. Yeah, I know Gabe. Um, yeah, they're a good band. They're a good band. I didn't cool. know they were doing shows again. That, that's crazy. I think this is a big kick in the ass for them to go ahead and keep doing it. I mean – yeah, I think it'll be uh, – or maybe not. Maybe they don't care about being in this band anymore. They're just doing it for feelings. Maybe, maybe it's like, um, you know, my chem and you know, yeah. it's a cool, cool thing. But, yeah, I love Thursday. I'm, I'm a big, huge Thursday fan, and we're going to do we're gonna do some gigs with them too. And that will take us right to Fest with all that touring, and we'll go head down into Gainesville, and we'll play we'll play the Fest down there. Um, and then that will be our year, I think. I might, awesome. I might play some acoustic shows over in Europe – in between um, Thanksgiving and Christmas, just on like a solo thing, but that isn't confirmed um, yet, but it's possible. Cool, cool. Dig it. Well, thank you so much. Um, I appreciate your time, brother. It was cool. Thanks, to- Mike. It's a pleasure to meet you. And now that we're friends, um, it makes me feel so good. <laughs> Absolutely, man. We'll do it again. Yeah, we'll Dude. talk again soon. All right. Take care. See you, bud.